Welcome, Bent Riders around the world. My name is Gary Solomon, and you're watching the Laid Back Bike Report. We're coming to you day, today live from the Laid Back Bike Studios in Pickerington, Ohio, where we produce this monthly webcast that can be watched live right now or later on YouTube. Please don't forget to, uh, to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you look down in the lower uh, right-hand corner, you'll see the little red subscribe button. Just click on that, take you right to the YouTube channel. You can subscribe and you'll be notified then whenever we have another broadcast coming up or when we go live. You can find out more about Laid Back Bike Report by clicking on the little white eye in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. That will take you to our website, and there you'll find all kinds of stuff, including past shows, what's coming up, uh, how we do the show, just lots of interesting things there. Our, um, our uh, sponsors are there. We hope you'll support them. So, yeah, little white eye right up there if you can. We hope you'll be part of our live broadcast today. You can do that by joining our live uh, chat, which, if you're watching on YouTube, is... Uh, just over to the right of the screen, you'll see a little box with live chat. Uh, please uh, take advantage of that. You can ask questions of our panelists, of our guests, um, and you can be part of the show. So uh, we would welcome you to uh, leave messages and comments uh, as you watch the show today. Uh, if you happen to be watching on uh, Facebook or, or Bent Rider or, or uh, Twitter, uh, you might want to click through to the YouTube uh, page uh, so that you can access that live chat. Um, okay, so what's coming up today? We have a really interesting show for you. I always like to think we do. Uh, first of all, a late edition, uh, live from Japan today, we have Julia Mark Lovegrove, who are bent rider uh, friends of ours who are touring on um, uh, in Asia for, I, I believe, three months. We're going to ask them uh, about the details that shortly. Uh, we have uh, our main interview today uh, with Dave DeYoung of Velocity USA. Uh, Dave is uh, ensconced uh, in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan today. He'll be talking to us about uh, what Velocity uh, does, how they build their wheels, and I think we're going to get a little view of, of how that's done, uh, both in the slideshow and I think we'll get a little live tour as well, so stay tuned for that. Uh, Brian Ball, of course, is with us and helping me out today with the slideshow. You may not see his face too often, but he's uh, he's really here, really helping. Uh, he's going to talk uh, on his uh, news uh, from the news desk today about uh, cruise, the Cruise Bike S40, the new bike uh, from Cruise Bike, and uh, the F Neo new front gearbox. Uh, interesting development there. Uh, Denny's here. He's going to report uh, from the uh, sports desk, and he's going to talk about uh, a lot of things, including the the Trans Am bike race. And he's going to give us a, a pretty extensive RAM preview, which uh, RAM's coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, Dana will be with us uh, doing uh, the remainder of his front derail report that he started a couple of shows ago. And then we'll go to the uh, Google Plus Bent Rider community and take a look at the uh, pictures, videos, uh, and, uh, and other things that are going on there. We'll, we'll check out the contest and see who's got the best posts of the month. And with that, folks... I want to talk to you a little bit about our sponsor this month, the Recumbent and Tandem Rider Magazine. Here's what they have to say. Recumbent cycling fans, don't miss the 2017 Recumbent CycleCon on October 6th through 8th at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center in Oaks, Pennsylvania. It's right on the Schoolkill River rails to trails route. You'll find an exhibit hall filled with 20,000 square feet of recumbent bikes, trikes, tandems, and cycling accessories. The show's outdoor demo riding area is where you'll have the chance to ride all the new machines like the Greenspeed GT26, TerraTrikes Rambler All-Terrain, and, and all the newest bents from manufacturers around the world. If you're a fan of electric assist cycling, You'll find exhibitors such as Falco there to answer your questions and provide demo rides, as well as electric assist trikes from Triot and other trike makers. The RCC show is produced annually by the staff of Recumbent and Tandem Rider magazine, which is now available free online in digital format. Get all the show details and more 
at the publication's website, www.rtrmag.com. So we are happy to have uh, RTR Mag with us as a sponsor this month. Uh, okay, let me introduce our panelists um, that we have with us. We uh, unfortunately are down a couple today. We uh, we don't have Carl Kidd with us uh, doing the slideshow as usual. Carl is struggling with a little health issue, uh, and we wish him the best. Uh, we hope to have hope to have uh, Carl back uh, next time. Uh, Lars Com uh, is not with us either. He's got some traveling, uh, a trip to the U.S. I guess coming up early in the week, so he wasn't able to join us either. But who do we have? Well. From Sarah, Pennsylvania, our laid-back sports desk anchor, Denny Voorhees, and doing the directing today. Hi, Denny. And uh, Denny is off to a good start with a nice freeze up. No, 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 no. There you are. Can't be. Can't be. Oh, yeah, we okay. have you now. Now I hear you. Okay, yeah. We're, we're here. We're here again, and we're looking forward to it. Thanks, and thanks for your help today on the directing, uh, Denny. All right, from Cold Spring, Kentucky. He just found that missing order of cheese curds from Bart's while combing his beard this morning. Yes, it's the esteemed co-editor of Bent Rider, Larry Varney. Hey, Larry. Hi, Gary. Hi, everybody. Uh, good to see you all again. And uh, uh, if it weren't for this uh, broadcast, I'd be out riding a trike. I think it's gorgeous weather out there right now. So maybe I'll do that later. So good to be on the show. All right. Well, we, uh, we're glad we have enough pull to, to keep you here. We appreciate having you. And now uh, from Rochester, New York, the founder and editor of Bent Rider Magazine and uh, the anchor of the late back news desk, it's Brian Ball. Hi, Brian. It's pouring here, so I don't mind being on at all. <laughs> That's good timing. I have no control over this stuff, of course, but Brian is also handling the slideshow duties today, as he did last uh, last show, and he did a, a great a, job. So attempting, we attempting to handle we'll, the slideshow. We'll make it work, as we always do. Right. Thanks, Brian. And from North Hollywood, California, our recumbent wrench and technology expert uh, is Dana Lieberman. He will be joining us later on in the show. And so at this point, I think it would be... Uh, it would be a good thing to do to head to uh, Japan. And I would like to introduce you to uh, two good friends of the show. Uh, this is Julie and Mark Lovegrove. Hello, guys. Hi, Hi Gary. everybody. Hi, Gary. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Well, it's so nice to have you. Uh, uh, folks may not know, but uh, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning uh, in Japan right now. So uh, these folks, aside from doing their touring, uh, have have woken up in the middle of the night, uh, given up a lot of rest to be with us today, and we sure appreciate that. It's great to be here to share share our experiences. And we okay. don't have to check out, check out till 11, so we can go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll let you do that. Okay, let's get into a, a few questions here and, and see what's, uh, a little bit about you, first of all. So tell us, where is your home? Yeah, um, home is Maidstone, Kent in the UK. Um, where where we enjoy riding our recumbents. Um, oh, I just love it. Tell tell me what recumbent bikes you have. Um, I I've got a Rand Stratus XP, and I've got a Bichetta Gyro Twenty. Lovely bike. <laughs> and then you have a recent no. edition. We have we 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 have a Rand Tandem. Yeah, yes, we do. Um, <laughs> that's the newest edition. Yeah, it's all shiny back at home, but we haven't we've ridden it much because uh, we're not at the time. But gonna okay, it so. Tell me a little bit, uh, just a real thumbnail sketch, if you can, about your past uh, touring escapades. Where have you been? Um, we've, we've done two USA cross-country trips. Um, the first one was on a Haspino, which is a semi-recumbent tandem. And the second one, um, I rode my Rand Stratus XP and Mark rode his Bichetta. Mm -hmm. um, we've also done a few short tours in um, France, the Netherlands, and the UK. In fact, when we got back from our first tour on, on the Pino, I sat on the Pino seat. I had a, I had a, I had a kind of leather seat and um, Brooke sat on. And um, when I got back, I thought, man, this is... I mean, we were stopping quite a lot at the end, every 10 miles at least, because I had saddle issues. That had pain. And then we got back, I stripped it down, I rebuilt the bike, and we went out for a ride about three months later. And I think I've still got this pain. That in me. I said to Julie halfway around, I said, no, nah. I said, I'm going to buy a recumbent. She said, oh, yeah, she goes. <laughs> oh, yes, 
We we've never looked, we've it's never looked back. Definitely the way forward. <laughs> we love we love yeah. them so much. We do. We do. You guys are strong advocates for the re, for the re, for recumbents, and uh, and you you have the experience that I think most of us have had to kind of get us there as well. So, all right, let's talk. <laughs> let's talk about the uh, the current tour. Let's talk about where uh, where you've been. Can you tell us uh, uh, when you left, um, and and uh, where you ended up, and and where you've been? Yeah, um, we left in April. Um, it's a three month trip. We we flew to um, um, Seoul, South Korea. Um, and then we rode the length of Korea on the Four Rivers Trail and with two friends. Um, it was their first um, long tour. And that was a great experience riding with friends and sharing a tour through their eyes because they were new to it. Um, and then from Busan, we, we, we'd ridden the length of Korea. We took a ferry to Japan, to Fukuoka. Um, and then we, we rode the first island, which is Kyushu. Um, we went to Nagasaki to the um, Peace Park where the atomic bomb was dropped. Um, and then we headed to the second, second island, um, Honshu. And we went to Hiroshima to this um, second Peace Park. Just to interrupt then, for a second, Julie, just to give you a little heads up. So I've, I've, uh, I've ripped a few of your pictures from Facebook and, you, and we're yeah. seeing, I, I don't know if you can see them now. So no, you don't need to tell yeah. the story of the pictures. I just wanted people to get a little flavor of the pictures. So, so just, I, I didn't want to confuse you, but I wanted to let you know what we're doing. So go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. Um, we, we, since we've been in Japan, we've been here six weeks now. We've ridden quite a few um, river trails but also quite a few busy roads. Um, yeah, there's some of the, the traffic is, because Japan is such a such a kind of mountainous country, all the, all the people live in the bits that are flat in between. And um, the roads they, can be quite busy. The roads can be fairly busy and, and quite challenging. Uh, it was on one the other day, actually, with lots of lorries. Uh, it was, yeah, and it can be good. I mean, when you're off, when you're, when you're riding with, without cars and things, it's just so beautiful. Because you can look oh. around more. Than that, but. Yep. We've got a, a comment from Joseph Hardy who uh, identified, uh, Mark, your da brim hat. Is that, uh, is that a da brim that you were That's, wearing? There? That is da brim, yeah. We ordered them from America. A lot of our stuff comes from America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, great. It's, it's a great hat. I've always, I've, I've, you know, it keeps me. I mean, we are quite red and looking a bit crumpled. <laughs> <laughs> but we, that's a great hat. Yeah, that to bring. I've, I've worn that across America the first time, and then I'll wear it all the time now. It's great. Yeah. You get quite um, a few comments here as well, don't you? I do get quite a few comments. I must say, when we're riding recumbents in Japan, well, everywhere, really, but in Japan, I mean, I'm behind Julie a lot, and then Julie goes past, and people are just dumbfounded. They look, and it's almost like they think we've been beamed down from outer space. <laughs> we go past. Like a little unusual, but it does the job. Brian, can you uh, go on to the next? There's a picture in there. I um, I know there was a a point where you had an opportunity to stop at a recumbent bike shop. I thought it might be interesting for you guys to tell that story. Maybe one more, Brian. There we go. I think that's yeah. it. Can you tell the story about this, if you would? Um, this is a recumbent bike shop that a Google Plus um member recommended to us um we he, he could see we was heading to osaka where the shop was and he put a comment on there if you're in the area go go and see this guy um the first time we stopped there it was closed and but we knew he was heading back that way so on the way back we called in there and then this is um y yushi is a, is a great guy um mm -hmm. he told us he he sells about 30 to 40 recumbents a year he had four in stock he did. I mean, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. This, um, yeah, and he had a trike, and um, he had a cruise bike. Yeah, he had a cruise bike. Yeah, a cruise bike quest, one of the kind of newer versions. So this is an unusual thing to see a recumbent never, bike shop. We've never seen a recumbent at all since we've left home. We've never, <laughs> we've never ever we've seen, not seen a one on the road. Apart from one, <laughs> apart from one Bellomobile we saw in, in Korea. In Korea on the trail in Korea, but unbelievable. Yeah. All right, and. Uh, I think that's it. that's it for the pictures. Let me um, so tell me how long is this this tour is is going to last? It's a three month tour, and um, we're two months into the tour, and we've done sixteen hundred miles so far. We've probably got about five to six hundred more to do. Yeah, tell me about that too. Where where are you heading? What tell me from today? I think you're you're making a move. Tell me where you're going from here. Yeah, we'll be heading back to Fukuoka um, because our trip it's a round round trip. We, we flew into Seoul and we're flying home from Seoul. So we've got to head back that way now. Um, so we've got to take a ferry back to Korea and we'll be riding the East Coast um, 
because because we rode down the middle of the country on the four rivers trail we're going to do a different route to get back to seoul um, so, so we'll see something different and the uh, the infrastructure for bikes in 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 Korea and, and Japan. You were talking a little bit earlier. Do you find them similar and excellent, or t can you compare them? Um, South Korea has got a lot of bike trails. Um, they mostly follow the rivers, and the the East Coast Trail is half finished. So when we head back, the first half we're going to be riding on roads, but then we're going to pick up the trail halfway um, along the coast, and that one's still being finished. So they're still working on them. But they have got a huge um, bike infrastructure with all these trails. You can ride the whole length of the country on a bike trail. Yeah, um, which, which we did. It was rather pleasant. It's 400 um, miles. Yeah. 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 I think it's 96% on a trail. And do you, do you think that uh, – is your experience that you've been well-received uh, in both countries uh, from people that you've encountered? Oh, people have been so friendly and so kind. Um, they all want to stop and talk, but it's, it's really difficult because they don't speak the language. And um, we, we thought m more people would speak English, but they don't. And we've got very little Japanese. Well, we know two words. <laughs> two, two words of two Japanese. Words. We keep trying to learn another one. <laughs> but people are generally interested in our trip and, and they come up to us and start jabbering away. And it's just, it is quite difficult. We show them a map. It's, 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 it's a real shame. We want to show they want to know what we're doing. And we, yeah, we do try and. There's a language barrier. There's definitely a language barrier, which is not what you get in America, of course. It's much easier. <laughs> <laughs> but you would recommend uh, to folks who are thinking of a, a place to uh, uh, to travel and tour on their bikes, you would recommend uh, to, to do a tour such as yours? Oh, definitely. Well, we would, yeah. I and mean, we've seen so much. We've seen so much. I mean, so the, much. The history you know. and, and um, the religion is very oh, interesting. The All the temples, the, the countryside. The yeah. countryside's beautiful. There's so much to see and do. Um, Japan okay, is a very, obviously a very busy place. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people on both of those uh, places. So, yeah. um, I've got a question. I think Larry asked this as well as uh, Joseph Hardy on chat. Uh, do you stay in hotels most of the time or do you prefer to camp? Um, well, our budget determines that we mostly camp, um, but there aren't many campsites, especially in Japan. Most of the campsites are in the mountains, which are obviously hard to get to no, on, a, on, a, on a bike unless you've got a vehicle and you want to climb lots and lots of mountains. Actually, yeah, I will just interrupt. On this first island that we're on now, and I, and I thought it was the first time because we're coming back, we came back to it, and lovely place for a motorcycle. It's very hilly, very hilly. And, uh, but, but So what we have to do, we, we camp in little parks. Yeah, we can. We try to find ones with yeah. with restrooms and so we can at least have a wash. I mean, we've never been disturbed. We've never been... I mean, there's there's lots of people. I mean, all all the older people here in the mornings, they're all the very in the early parks, risers. Uh, early risers. They're in the parks doing all their stretches, stretching and they'll, and exercises. they'll <laughs> say hello to us and yeah. wave to us. It's yeah. very acceptable to camp in these parks. Well, they don't seem to worry. <laughs> Nobody has ever told us to move on, or that's quite happy. Great. Um, okay, let me. I think this will be the last question, but. Um, you guys, we've talked about the fact that you guys uh, do a fair amount of, of bicycle touring. And so I, I think folks might want to know how, what sort of lifestyle do you live that allows, what do you do to allow for you to take a tour every couple of years? It's a wonderful thing to do. I bet a lot of people like to do it, but they have jobs, they have, uh, they have obligations. So tell me, tell me what it is that you guys do. <laughs> I, I, I mean, Julie and I had always dreamed, well, recently in the last five or six, eight, nine years, we've always dreamed of cycling around the world. We've got people that we admire, people that we've read. And uh, one year I was in France on holiday, I said to Julie, why don't we cycle across the United States? I said, we, you know, it's a dream of ours, let's, let's go for it. So we, we did it, and we, but we gave up our jobs to do it. And we'd all had jobs up to that point. And then we're not retired. I mean, we came back from that and we worked together now. Well, we, we work we together. We set up our own business. We set up our own business. Um, just husband and wife, we do building, gardening, yeah, decorating. Yeah. Um, and then, but, I mean, it allows us the freedom to not give up another job. We just go off. And, in fact, we've been married 30 years. So, I mean, we, 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 don't, have a mortgage. we don't have a mortgage anymore. That's, that's the main thing that, that allows us to do it. We, don't, we, have, we haven't got a mortgage anymore. So, we, 
We save up. We, we work save hard up. Yeah. when we're working. Well, working's hard, really hard. <laughs> so it's really, it's all about the priorities, isn't it? You set yourself the priority because you love to do this so much. And then That's you right. kind of set your life uh, to, uh, you know, the your lifestyle and, and what you need to do to, to make some money and to have a job or or start a business to, to, to be able to fulfill the ideas of that lifestyle. I yeah, think that's right. so admirable. We changed our life to accommodate our dreams. Well, that's what we do in it. I mean, you know, we do spend a lot of our money on it, but, you know. But we love it. You only get one chance, don't you, really? I so. think that's are, so are, true. So true. And we are very lucky we're living the dream. We do. But we know. make it happen. Yeah, I can remember the first time we was in that we was in the USA. We was in Virginia, and, and I just thought, we're in Virginia. How can we be in Virginia?" So I mean, it's a great thing, and uh, and the same with Japan, really. We, I mean, we. You know, but Julie said, "Would you rather be here or at work?" She said that to me a couple of days ago, and I said, "Well, you know." And some days are really hard. Some days are not pleasant, really. I mean, it can be raining. Yeah, when you get hilly. bad weather. But we we rode uphill for more than that. We didn't ride. We pushed and rode uphill for the day before yesterday for four hours. So I mean, you know, it's not all pleasant, but. Definitely better than work. <laughs> but you get, no sense of you get a great sense of achievement. Yeah, a well deserved, a well deserved uh, sense yeah. of achievement, I would say. So, and all right, I think we're going to have to wrap it. Go I ahead, Mark. Say one more thing. Sure. Of it's, it, oh, well, I mean, it stays with you for a long time afterwards. The, right? memories. You, the memories. You think about them all the time. You in your mind, you're at work. You think, oh, yeah, I remember. Being. So you know, it, it, I mean, it costs a lot, but you get a lot from it. So right. So it's a matter it's of uh, a balance, right? So are you? In your life, are you collecting things or are you collecting memories, right? I mean, uh, it depends what's yeah, valuable to you. Definitely memories. memories and bikes. Yeah, and bikes. bikes. You have a nice collection going there. That's a great. Yeah, well, All right. Tell me, tell me uh, where folks can follow you. So yeah, I know you have a couple of uh, a couple of places where you have an online presence. How, how would you best think people can follow your travels? Yeah, I've got um, a journal on Crazy Guy on a Bike. Um, so if you go to Crazy Guy on the Bike, there's a little search box in the right-hand corner. If you put in Soul to Soul, um, it's Soul as in the place, and then uh, the number two, Soul to Soul. That's because we're doing a, a round trip. It's, um, just, soul soul. And I've also got a Facebook page. It's called The Recumbent Duo. Um, so you can follow us on either of those. Recumbent Duo. Okay. And, of course, as folks who follow us know, we will um, – we will put that in the description section of the uh, YouTube video so folks will be able to click on those and find you. Uh, any last questions, panel, anything? Okay, a quick one from Mark Ropers, uh, our friend from the Netherlands. Do you mainly ride along the coast because of the mountains? Um, we tend to, yes. Well, we have done in Japan. I mean, in Japan, we've tried to keep away from mountains. We've been up quite a few, but we tend to, yeah. We because, because the roads are very busy, um, if you come away from the coast, you end up doing a lot of climbing. And it's quite often it can be on a narrow road with no shoulder, um, which is quite quite challenging. Yeah, I mean, oh. So we tend to stay near the coast. That makes that makes good sense. We have a few mountains. <laughs> yeah. Can I just say that I've got a lovely set of Velocity wheels on my Ram Stratus XP. Yeah, Velocity great, great. wheels are, today. <laughs> That's, they are amazing wheels. <laughs> Dino <Dynafetum>. them. <laughs> All right, and, there and, you have and, it, folks. An unsolicited... So, uh, Kind of uh, contribution yeah, from no, from well, Japan on Velocity well, Wheels. We're going to talk yeah. to we're going to talk to Dave from Velocity here shortly. So thanks so much, uh, Julia, Mark. Uh, we we appreciate so much what you've done, uh, to, especially to get up so early and, and and talk to us. We 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 love having you on, and we'll we'll follow you. We'll we'll check you out a little bit later on. Um, so be safe. Have a great rest of your tour, and uh, and thank, thank you. you so much. Hi, Julia. Thank Hi, you for Mark. having us on it. Oh, you know, I hi, forgot Dana. that Dana knows you. Yes. I found yes. that out. There's Dana there. So Dana says yeah, hi. Dana, Dana, Dana built my um, starter sex people. Yeah, he's, yeah he's built by it. Brilliant. Still going strong. I'm it's glad to see you still riding it. Yeah. yeah. This yeah. is it's a small world, hard. folks. You're seeing it right Julie here. It. Okay, yeah. let's, no, let's move along. And, uh, okay. and uh, we're going to go to Velocity next. Thanks a lot, you guys. You Feel free to stick Thank with you. us as, long as, as long as you can until you fall asleep and we will. We'll not blame you for that. So, all right. We will. Very, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Bye bye. Thank you. All right, folks. Let me uh, let me go next. Uh, we're going to go next to uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, Dave DeYoung. He's uh, in charge of sales and uh, customer relations at Velocity USA. Uh, over the last eight years, he's worked in many areas of the company, including 
wheel building, shipping and receiving, and event sponsorship, among others. Uh, we're glad he's taken the time to be with us uh, this weekend. So, hello, Dave. Hello, hello. I just wanted to say thank you for uh, for having us on. We really appreciate it. Well, it's um, a pleasure. It's here. As you know, we've been working on this for a little while, so um, it's it, you guys are, are so uh, well represented in, uh, in the recumbent world, and uh, I think it's about time we, we start uh, having a little bit closer look at what it is you mm -hmm. do and, uh, and a little bit more about your wheels. So um, we're going to start out, folks, with uh, uh, Dave has uh, created a, a slideshow uh, presentation. So, uh, Dave, if you want to go ahead and um, and share your screen and start the slideshow, we'll go sure. with that first, and then we'll we'll what questions you don't uh, answer in the slideshow, we'll we'll see if we can ask you afterwards. So, there we go. Okay, you go ahead. All right. So, um, a lot of not, uh, there's not a lot of people that know all that goes into uh, making a bicycle rim and a wheel. So, um, I put together a little slideshow here to kind of give you an idea um, what exactly it takes to make a bicycle rim. So, um, if you guys have any questions afterwards, I'll be happy to answer them. But um, this is a presentation of what goes into making a bicycle rim. So. Um, First of all, we get extrusion, and it's generally in lengths of about 16 to 12 feet, um, depending on what size models of uh, rims we're going to roll. If it's like a 700C um, road size, then we're going to get a longer extrusion so we can get more rims out of them. If it's uh, rolling a lot of 20-inch 451s or 406 size rims, we can get a little shorter. And, um, we don't have as much waste. So this here is uh, a couple photos of the extrusion that we get. Um, gets dropped off in these giant pallets, and we have to break them down and pull them into our parking lot, and everybody parks on the street because <laughs> we don't have a, a huge parking lot. Um, right here is Austin. Um, this is a short video clip, and he's taking the longer 16-foot extrusion, and he's rolling it into three rims. I'll just show this video for you. Whoops. So here he's putting it through a, a um, through a series of rollers and those rollers are basically turning it into three individual rims. At this point, uh, the rim is being joined. Um, we use two different types of joining methods. We use what they call a sleeve join. It's a smaller extrusion that fits inside of uh, the larger extrusion of the rim. And that gets epoxied and um, then joined together. This picture, this video here, he's using a, uh, a pin join. Um, our Atlas rim and our No BS rim uses a pin join. Um, he puts it in this machine. He's got two pins down here, and uh, this basically clamps it together. At that point, uh, the epoxy still has a little time to set up, so um, we have the opportunity to check the join of the rim and make sure that it's nice and flat. And um, if it's not, uh, this is a great opportunity to kind of scrap the rim and start back over. Um, if it's great, then we move on. So here he's checking the, the quality of the rim. He's checking the joint to make sure that it, uh, it's good to go. And um, he can make small adjustments with this clamp. He actually has a little gauge down there that uh, with a mirror on it so he can see how far out the rim is. He's making minor adjustments as he's going around. Um, at that point the rim gets drilled. There's a number of different spoke counts 
available. Uh, Velocity is kind of known for uh, the ability to make a, a variety of different size rims as well as spoke count uh, or spoke drilling rims and uh, we can accommodate 16 hole all the way up to 48 hole so if there's somebody with a, a tandem and they need strong strong wheels we'll build up in a 48 hole um, if somebody's looking for a nice light way to race wheels uh, we can drill them to a 16 hole uh, most common drillings are 28, 32, and 36 in most instances. This is just a small video that shows the, uh, the rim being drilled. The angle of the drills um, does make a difference too. Uh, you want the angle of the spokes to exit the rim at a, a certain angle to provide a stronger wheel. Um, after that, the rim gets drilled. Uh, we have an anodizing line, and that's where we do all our anodized finishes. So we have uh, finishes from uh, black and silver are um, definitely the most uh, common colors, but uh, we also have the ability to do uh, polished. Um, we can do blue, purple, red, and uh, there's some other colors. And this is a fully, almost fully automated anodizing line. We have cranes that come in and drop them into the different tanks as we go. Some rims uh, need to have a machine sidewall. And this uh, basically provides a sidewall for the uh, brakes on your bicycle. Um, to kind of hold on to this the rim and slow you down if that rim is not machined it makes for the braking to be uh, a little more difficult and doesn't give you as great as performance so here he's got the rim on a lathe and he's going to spin this around there's a, a small uh, piece of uh, almost like a needle that comes down it drops on the rim and that machines the sidewall Of course, if you had a disc brake bike, you wouldn't necessarily need a machine sidewall. Um, but in this instance, with a rim brake, you would need a machine sidewall. Um, at that point, it's kind of the finishing touches we put on a decal. Uh, it gives the, the guy that decals it one more final look to make sure everything is uh, checks out. There's no anodizing flaws and um, other issues. We then stock all our rims and uh, Velocity sells uh, at least four times as many rims to bicycle shops and companies as we do wheels. So uh, we send out pairs of rims, we send out boxes of 22 to 40 rims at a time um, to shops that build up their own wheels or custom build them for customers. We ship rims and wheels all over the world. Uh, we have markets in Russia, India, New Zealand, Thailand, the Philippines, uh, you name it. Um, Velocity is a, a global company. And at one time, Velocity was, uh, the, um, the distribution was here at Grand Rapids, but uh, the factory was all down in Australia. So we used to get containers of rims all the way from Australia shipped to our door here in Grand Rapids. If we are going to build it into a wheel, um, we have to pull the rim and the hubs required for that wheel build. We have uh, a number of different spoke options. We, uh, bladed spokes for a light, fast racing wheel, double butted. Uh, spokes for more of a heavy duty um, build and then we have our standard 14 gauge each wheel because it has a different hub and different spoke count all the spokes need to be cut to a specific length 
So on the right here, I show a, a box of two hubs and the three different lengths of spokes needed to build that wheel set. Somebody has to go in there and cut all the spokes and measure them, make sure that uh, they are the correct lengths for the, the specific hub that we're using. Each velocity wheel is uh, built to order, so um, every wheel that goes out of here is specific to what the customer is asking for, and uh, we don't usually build ahead. Um, we might do that in some OE instances, but for the most part, a customer calls us or a bike shop calls us. They say, hey, I have a... Uh, a guy looking for a set of bicycle wheels. This is exactly what he's looking for. He needs to have a 2832 hole. It needs to be on our, you know, your race hub. He's looking for something light and fast. Uh, we will build that wheel set up specifically for that customer. Um, I put together a, a short video here for you. Just what goes into a, to building a wheel. Looks like my panelists here usually during the end of the show. Very nice. And from there, the wheels or rims get boxed up and they get shipped out all over the world. Um, like I said, we ship uh, everywhere, uh, just about everywhere in the world. We've had customers, I mean, you name it, some of the smallest islands and um, some of the largest countries and far-flung areas. Um, wherever DHL, FedEx, or UPS will, will take them, I guess. Um, we, we make a number of different extrusions now, and uh, below is a picture of all the different extrusions that we have, and these extrusions are designed for specific applications. Um, we have our heavy-duty cliffhanger for more of a heavy-duty touring. Um, we have something lightweight uh, road and everything in between um, we we just uh, we do a lot of different uh, different bicycle rims for different applications on the right there is um, some rims that we made for some penny farthing customers um, the old-fashioned high wheel bikes and inside that rim you can see that is a 700 C size road uh, road rim um, these penny farthing rims were getting shipped out last week to Australia, believe it or not. There's a company down there that uh, specializes in making old high wheel bikes. Very, very nice, Dave. Thank you. <clears throat> that was a nice little peek at, uh, at what goes on. Um, Let's see here. Yeah, just um, you need to stop sharing, and then you'll be okay. Uh, there we go. Uh, okay, let me um, let me get out with a couple of questions. First of all, uh, Dave, if we can, I want to. Uh, I had a question first of all from um, Mark Roper's. Basically, we're, they're asking what uh, what material do you use for these wheels? All of the ribs are made out of aluminum. Uh, the 6000 series aluminum. Okay. And so uh, one of the, uh, a follow-up question, uh, because that was Marco Roper who asked that question and was concerned about uh, corrosion uh, with aluminum. Is that uh, is the alloy that you use uh, corrosion resistant? Is that how you handle that? Uh, it is to a certain extent. I know, for, uh, for instance, if you're out on the coast where there's a little more salt and grime, uh, your rims are going to tend to corrode a little bit more, 
than uh, usual, but that's very rare. Um, you're going to outwear your your wheel set before that, that happens. Okay. Yes. All right. So let me um, – you – you uh, touched on uh, the Australian, um, uh, early Australian manufacturer and shipping and that kind of thing. I thought maybe that would uh, be a good point to jump into my questions, which have to do with um, the history of Velocity. Um, we chatted a little bit about uh, maybe you talking about that. So uh, could you go to the beginning and tell us a little bit about the early history of, of Velocity in Australia, I think, and then, and then how it got to where it is today and what you did then and, and what you do now that's different? Sure. Uh, Velocity started back in 1989 in Australia, Brisbane, Australia, and it was started by two brothers, uh, Tom Black and John Black. And Tom and John uh, used to work at a bike shop here in Grand Rapids. Uh, Tom moved down to Australia where he um, started working and uh, basically designed this uh, velo cage. And it's a piece of extruded aluminum. It went through a machine, and uh, it was uh, basically uh, shaped into this form. And basically started importing them or exporting them here to Grand Rapids for the brother John. Um, and John would sell them in the bike shop and just started distributing them all over the U.S. It wasn't about until... 1991 that Velocity started making rims and the first rim that Velocity made was the Velocity Arrow and that was more of a road size rim um, but uh, we had the ability to drill it in a number of different uh, spoke counts and um, we powder coated it in different colors and anodized it and um, that's kind of how Velocity started making rims. Okay and then you were tell me about the Jacksonville connection. So you, you part of the business was in Jacksonville for a while then, yes? Yep. So um about I would say seven or eight years ago, uh well, it was two thousand twelve, Velocity moved to Jacksonville, Florida. And um they moved to Jacksonville to produce all our, our products here in the US, which kinda helped um uh help with the cost of production to to stay relevant in the market um it it wasn't that bad when we were down in australia because the exchange rate was quite a bit in our favor it was a lot better for us but uh at some point it that changed and so we decided to move uh production here to the u.s um tom black he does not like the winter <laughs> And here at Grand Rapids, Michigan, we, we tend to see some, some winter and some snow. So at, uh, he, he was kind of reluctant to move all the way up to Michigan. So he moved to Jacksonville, Florida. And um, they were there for a few years. And in 2016, uh, we moved the whole production up here to Grand Rapids, Michigan. Okay, yeah. And so that's, uh, that's where you are right now. And everything's there. All right, let me ask, uh, uh, how has the manufacturing of wheels changed over the years? Has there been some changes in the way wheels are made, or is it pretty much done the same way that it, it's been done for a very long time? Uh, it has changed a little bit. Um, there is a lot more technology and a lot more uh, computer-aided design that goes into the, ex the extrusions, um, designing the extrusion. But uh, for as far as building a wheel goes, the the methods are generally the same. Okay, and some parts are still built by hand, though. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, we here at Velocity, we don't have any type of wheel building machine. Um, I know some of the larger companies uh, have wheel building machines where they just put the rim in the machine and the machine kind of takes care of it, drills it up, trues it. Uh, spits it out the other side, and then somebody kind of touches it up. All our wheels are hand-built um, from start to finish. Right, and I think, so I'm not going to name the company, but we did do a little profile and a visit to a, a recumbent company that actually has one of those machines, which they're kind of proud of. 
uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and and it built uh, the the wheel in no time flat, and we could see it all happen. Tell me what you think the advantages of a hand built wheel are over a machine built wheel. So, uh, the machine built wheel is is definitely going to uh, be a little bit quicker, um, but as far as getting your hands on it and uh, you really need to see the the variance in spoke tension around the the entire wheel. Um, these guys shoot for you know five to ten percent variance between one spoke to the next. Uh, it makes a big difference. They have the ability to stress these spokes as they're going. Um, in that one video clip, uh, the wheel building, they put it in a machine that basically sets the spoke heads. But on top of that, they're going around the rim and they're squeezing the spokes uh, every couple minutes and that's just really you know pre-stressing them um, they can get it a little bit closer and uh, if your hands are on it the whole time you just it you have a little better uh, feeling of what's going on okay um, I've got a question from Bruce Erdman on chat here asking how competitive are the aero aluminum wheels compared to, say, carbon wheels? That's a good question. Um, there are uh, there are a number of, uh, I guess, the aluminum rims can be pretty competitive as far as weight goes. Uh, for instance, our, our Blunt SS mountain bike rim is uh, 30 millimeters wide, and it's coming in right around 420 grams. So it's very competitive to what's on the market as far as carbon goes. Um, there's also, you know, there's there's definitely some advantages and disadvantages to carbon versus aluminum. Um, some of the times, I mean, if you you hit a curb with a carbon wheel, you could crack it, and you got to start fresh and purchase a brand new uh, a brand new rim. And sometimes with aluminum, they're a little bit more malleable. Um, you can kind of go back and uh, retention it and um, pull that, pull the uh, the bend out of the rim. Okay, yeah. Um, that kind of leads into this question I have about um, how you build wheels differently for uh, your customer who say is going to race, uh, your customer uh, that's going to tour, and the one that commutes. Now you you showed us all those different extrusions and stuff. But uh, can you give us kind of a um, an overview of what the differences are for those sorts of wheels? Sure. Um, so there's a number of I got uh, this here is all the different extrusions that we make, um, and some are are better than others at certain things. For instance, this here is our dually rim. Um, the dually is a, a wide mountain bike rim. It's uh, it's used to give you more traction on the trail, use as wide of a tire as possible. And um, so you can basically crawl over, you know, rocks and sticks and uh, logs and things. Um, you get a, a much uh, larger tire. Uh, something like our aileron, for instance, is a disc specific. That's this one right here. Uh, disc specific. Uh, tubeless compatible rim and that is uh, 25 millimeters wide so that uh, goes good with you know a 25c to a 1 uh, 1.5 inch tire um, a lot of it has to do with the tires that the customer is going to run to generally speaking if you're touring um, you're going to want a heavy duty touring tire with a heavy duty touring rim at least probably 36 or 40 spoke count. Um, you want something where you can put a little bigger tire on to just give you more cushion and uh, support and you know easier, less rolling resistance on the road. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier you talked about the uh, differences between the carbon and the aluminum wheels and how uh, it's a little bit more malleable. Uh, the aluminum uh, wheels are, and uh, you might be able to perhaps make some repairs. I have a question from SBC Clydesdale on uh, our live chat, and he's asking, how can we get velocity wheels repaired? What's the process? 
Uh, generally speaking, you can take um, you can take them to your shop. Uh, the the bicycle shop could take a look at them and say, okay, this is uh, this seems to be an easy fix. It, sometimes it all it is is a quick truing um, and just a, a spoke wrench um, and truing up the wheel a little bit, making sure it's still round. Um, and sometimes it it needs a little bit more than that. Sometimes it needs the the rim replaced. Sometimes it's a broken spoke. Uh, so I guess it all depends. Uh, we often, you could send rims or wheels into us here and we'll take a look at them and uh, make sure that, you know, if it's just something minor, we could take a look at it and replace it as needed. Um, sometimes that requires a complete new wheel build. It's hard to say. Um, this day and age, it seems like the industry is moving very quickly, um, which is great in some some sense, the technology and um, and things are, are just moving along very quickly, but at the same time, that makes it difficult for customers that have parts or wheels uh, on any parts really on their bike that are five to six years old. It's uh, it's difficult to keep them compatible. Sure. All right. Here's a, a direct question: What is dishing a wheel? What is a dish? So. If your wheel is sitting in your forks, you could uh, dish it to the right or the left, and you basically you want that wheel uh, smack dab in the middle of your your front fork, for instance. Um, and the dish, uh, I mean, if it's not dished properly, it could be over to the right side of the the fork, and it'll make it a little bit uh, more difficult to ride and a little more difficult to handle. And um, Certain wheels have to be dished differently, um, specifically with trikes, uh, for instance. If the front wheels on a on a trike um, sometimes require a specific uh, dish um, based on where their brakes line up and how far the uh, the manufacturer wants the wheels to sit out. Dave, so if you if you dish a wheel, that means you're indenting part of the rim. What exa what ac what actually is dishing? Um, so you want the rim to line up center of the hub. Um, I have a, a hub here, for instance. You want that rim to line up in the center of the hub from, from side to side. Uh, if it's left, if it's too far this way or this way, it's going to make it very difficult. Um, and it's not going to build a very good wheel. Okay. If, that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does make sense. I just didn't know if everyone knew what that was, so I thought it might get a, it might be just the right guy to ask that question. All right, let's uh, let's kind of bring it back to recumbents now. So, it you know you you make a popular wheel, you you send them all over the world. But I got to tell you, from so many people that uh, I've talked to and and bikes that we've seen at various times, velocity wheels are very popular with recumbent bikes. Give me an idea why, if you can, if you know, why is it such a popular choice for recumbent bikes? Um, I think the the recumbent market in specific is is very tight knit community of people, and uh, for recumbent riders, they are very um, brand loyal, which is is great. Um, but uh, one of the the reasons Velocity is on a lot of recumbents is the opportunity to make a specific size wheel or drilling um, wheel specifically for some of these customers. Uh, recumbent OE manufacturers are generally a little bit uh, smaller. Um, operating cost makes a, a big difference. They can't just go to a large um, company over in uh, Taiwan and say, you know, I want 15 sets of this wheel or 20 sets of this wheel or I need the specific size rim for this model of recumbent that I'm making or trike. Um, and that's where kind of velocity fits in. We're, we're smaller. Um, we have the ability to kind of jump uh, when asked to, to jump and, and, to, um, and to just be able to provide for some of these s customers um, okay. that some yeah, of these so, larger I mean, manufacturers wouldn't be able to. Can I, can I add something, Gary? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Dana. Uh, so I've been working with Velocity for almost 14 years now. 
Um, and David, I, I think you're not giving yourself enough credit. Uh, Velocity built some really good wheels. They're using good quality bearings. They're obviously building their own rims. Uh, and it really allows you to get a matched set. So a lot of the bikes, especially when I started on the short wheelbase bikes, you'd have a 20 inch front wheel and a 26 inch rear wheel. And Velocity at the time was the only company where you could get that matching set of wheels. And from an aesthetic uh, point of view, that's a good thing. There are a couple other companies that uh, have jumped into the market of uh, Welta's now doing some uh, wheels for uh, Bichetta. You know, the sun rims have always been available, but Velocity seems like they've always made it a priority to accommodate the, uh, the, the, the bikes that have different size wheels so we can get a matching wheel set. And I, I'll just say, having worked with them for a long time, they've, they're just a great company to work with. I mean, I've called them up and said, oh shoot, I forgot to order a set of wheels. Can you get this out tomorrow? And oh yeah, we'll take care of it. So uh, give yourself more credit, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so customer service, you really didn't talk about absolutely. that. Absolutely. But I think that's yeah. a, that sounds like what Dana's. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, that sounds absolutely. like uh, what what he's talking about there. So uh, that's not on my list of questions, but I think it's an important one. So tell me, obviously, you do emphasize customer service. How uh, how do you uh, how do you set your business up so that you can provide that sort of customer service? What do you do? Um, well, we know that the, the customer is always right, um, and that was something that I've kind of was uh, brought into this company uh, being taught from from my boss and mentor, John Black, and uh, he made it a point, you know, to, to take care of your customers, and they they will take care of you, and um, especially with the, the recumbent community, but uh, it makes a big difference. Um, I'm one of the customer service reps here. There's a handful of other guys here. We all take our part. We all wear a number of different hats. Um, and we're just able to kind of jump uh, when asked to jump. And um, we make sure that uh, the customer is getting what they need and what they expected. OK. That's that's so important. All right. Um, we kind of talked about uh, selling to the, the manufacturers, the manufacturers and such. Um, we only touched about uh, private uh, customers. So uh, a guy or a gal who has a recumbent bike is interested in a, a, a new set of uh, velocity wheels. Um, how do you work with them to, how do they go about uh, finding those, the wheels that they need? Do you work with them on that? Is that through the shop or is it through your website? How do you do that? Sure. So our, um, our bike shops and dealer network it, across the U.S. is very important to us. Um, we try very hard uh, to make sure that customers have what they need and what they're looking for, and that means a lot of times going into their bike shop um, and and talking with the the um, the people at the bike shop. They know a lot of different bikes, um, and for recumbent, that might be a little bit more difficult. And trikes and things, there's um, a few less shops. That uh, that specialize in that, but um, for the most part, they know the specs. Um, they know what your bike needs, and so um, we often try to point people to shops as their um, their first resource. If that doesn't work, um, there's a number of wheel companies that are more than happy to help out, and we also we take a lot of customers ourselves, and um, they contact us. They have questions of you know, what will work on our bike, and uh, we try to talk them through it the best we can um, and kind of consult them on their wheel needs. Okay. And sometimes people don't realize, you know, that they'll just, they'll find a wheel set and think, oh, it's the, the lightest wheel out there, and this is what I have to have. It's going to make me faster. Um, but there's other things that come into to play, you know, what size tire are you running, what type of pressure. Um, Sometimes your your tire is going to perform better with a, a wider rim, for instance. Um, spacing there's uh, there's different spacing options, front and rear. Um, nowadays, uh, with trikes, for instance, there seems like uh, the front wheels on a trike are um, they have different axle standards from one model to the next. So um, that's where it's important to talk to the um, the shop that you purchase your trike from, or 
you know, call us and email us, and uh, we'll help you out with that too. All right, right into my next question, which is what's the best way for customers to communicate their questions to Velocity? So uh, email, call you, is that one of those two methods the best you would say? Yep, um, email is usually the best, um, and I'm happy to, to take emails. It's dave at velocityusa.com, pretty straightforward. Uh, we also have the wheeldepartment.com, and that's specifically uh, – helping customers get the 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 wheel set that they need um that's kind of consulting them from beginning to end all the way through uh we got a couple guys that um that take a look at that every day and um there's a few options on there so what what type of bike are you looking you know to buy a set of wheels for what size tires are you running are you running disc brake and it'll just go through the whole line and then um if there's some other information in there, then that way we have all our information in front of us and we can just contact the customer directly um, via email and say, okay, this is, you know, these are your three options, for instance, and um, this is what we think will work best for you. Wheels are complicated things. I've learned that already. And so I, I would recommend the folks really, they, they ask the experts so that they get the uh, the correct answers. It's, it's an important uh, safety feature of the bikes as well. You want something that's going to hold up and uh, not not be uh, the focus of some sort of problem. So make sure you check with those guys if you have a question. Now, speaking Gary? of questions, uh, yeah, let me just ask this one and then uh, Brett, sure. back to you, Dan. So, so SBC Clydesdale on live uh, chat. Uh, are Velocity Hubs using cartridge bearings or loose bearings, Dave? So most of our hubs are seal cartridge bearings. Um, that makes a, a big difference as far as having to maintain them. Um, they'll run smooth for many, many miles. Um, there are a few uh, models that we still use a, um, a loose ball bearing, and those are our, our sport model hubs. Um, and those, you know, take a little more finesse. Uh, sometimes you got to pull out the bearings, you got to clean them, you got to grease them, you got to adjust uh, adjust them a little bit to get them rolling smooth. But even with that, I mean, it's it's with anything, the the better you at are maintaining it and keeping it up to, to snuff, the, the better you are going to roll and um, keep moving. So, No doubt. Dana, go ahead. I was just going to ask um, if you could enlighten our audience right now, some things to keep an eye on for worn out rims that use rim brakes? Sure. Uh, so if you're using rim brakes, you'll often see that the side wall of the rim, um, which is where your brakes line up on the side wall of the rim, it's usually a flat vertical section. Um, and that's the, the part that's generally machined. Uh, if you take a look at that, sometimes it takes a little cleaning because you'll have some brake dust on there. But uh, if you see little cracks sometimes developing on there, um, then it might be time to uh, to replace the rim. Sometimes it, you'll get a concave type shape uh, where your brake pads continue to sit and ride in the same spot. And so you just want to keep an eye on that. Great, thank okay. you. Thanks, Dana. All right. Um, let's kind of wrap up the uh, interview portion here. So tell me about uh, any future plans for Velocity that you can talk to us about. Can you give us an idea where you guys are headed? Uh, new products, uh, new places to go. What are you doing? So we've uh, been developing a road rim these last couple, uh, this last year, I would say. It's called the Quill. Um, it's a machine sidewall road rim, and that's uh, that's been real uh, important for us to kind of be competitive in that market. Um, we continue to develop our recumbent uh, side of things. There's um, there's a number of different options out there. There's a number of different bikes. It seems like everybody's doing a little bit something different. So it's it's been difficult to kind of hone in on that and. Um, and get a specific recumbent lineup. That's something we've been working on um, developing over the last year or so. Um, we hope to 
we hope to be at the uh, recumbent cycle con again this year as far as uh, the shows go um looking forward to that uh, charles just does a great job with that show and i was you know so happy to be there last year and uh velocity to be there and represent because um I think it's just a great opportunity to to meet customers, you know, face to face. And sometimes these customers are are guys from shops and um, that you're talking to on the phone on a weekly basis. So it's great to to meet them in person. Um, and who knows? Uh, hopefully, you know, there's a couple other shows out there that we'll try to get to this year. Um, it's it's tough to say. Okay. Super. That's yeah. We look forward to seeing you at uh, at CycleCon this year, which uh, is moving, of course, to Philadelphia. I'm going to talk for a minute about that. Uh, Dave, you want to give us a little uh, look, see into the uh, into the floor uh, over at sure. uh, your facility. Well, Dave's going to take us. Hopefully, get that uh, phone working, plug in over there. Uh, while I, I um, a, as I told you folks, uh, you want to come back to me for a second, then. Um, there we go. Thanks. Um, our sponsor uh, for today's show is Recumbent and Tandem Rider um, Magazine. Uh, they are the people who run Recumbent Cycle Con. Dave just mentioned that, so I thought I would tell everyone, uh, give you a heads up. It's going to be mentioned again at the uh, second uh, part of the commercial that I do for them, but uh, it's moving to Philadelphia from Ohio, and uh, I think it's October 6th and 8th is what I said. So uh, we hope to see many of you there, and if you want to come uh, uh, you know, and see what's going on uh, in the recumbent world, that is the place to do it in this country. So, uh, And you can uh, ask more questions of, uh, of uh, Dave. He'll be there, apparently. And, uh, and come and see us as well. We'll be there uh, doing our report. So, uh, Dave, are you about ready to go there? You bet. Can you still hear all me right. all right? Yeah, we hear you great. Hang on a second. We're going to switch back to you. Denny, if you would. There we go. Thank you, Denny. All right. And, uh, yeah, so go ahead and, and tell us where you are and what we're looking at. Sure. So here I'm in the, the warehouse, um, and this is where basically all our rims are are made um, to my left here you'll see all the extrusion uh, that we have brought in um, and the lengths of it and there's uh, a number of different models of extrusion they're all kind of organized specifically in models and sizes um, and you can kind of see up here that looks like it's an A23 OC extrusion. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Um, okay, so I'm walking into where we roll all the rims. Um, this here looks to be a quill. They all get numbered uh, based on which box they come out of the batch. That way, if there's any issues, we can kind of go back and take a look at them. Um, during the rolling process and it rolls on our, that machine that you showed on that video right that's yeah yep this is the machine that rolls it uh, i don't think i showed this part of it but uh this is the saw blade that cuts the three three rims after they're rolled um there's a blade in there it comes down does a chop and after we get three rims we stack them up as such We come over here to um, where the rims are joined. Um, this is what an unjoined rim looks like. This is again a 700C quill. It takes a little joiner such as this. It, this is the extrusion that I was talking about that fits inside of the rim extrusion itself. Uh, that gets um, epoxied with a type of epoxy. That's basically heated up um, and gives you some time to work with it. Uh, it gets put in this this ring that clamps it down. There's different rings for different sizes. Uh, up on the wall there, you can see all the different rings available. Um, different sizes, different rims, just to give you an idea. Once that rim is joined, 
uh, there's a little bit of time to set it up. And that's where you saw the guy setting it on this um, this table. He rolls it, make sure it's it's uh, nice and straight. And down here is the little gauge that he can see how far out it is. After it gets joined, it gets set up and heated. Um, that just sets the epoxy and these basically a big uh, iron. The rim then comes over here to our, our drill press or our drill machine. Um, it gets drilled. This takes some setup for, uh, for each individual size and rim. Um, we have to set it up to just set up the spoke angles, um, set up the size of the rim that we're doing. Uh, sometimes that can take some time to do. From there, it goes over to our anodizing line. This is the anodizing line. There's a number of different tanks. Um, it gets put on these uh, these things here. It's basically the trolley that that runs it, drops it in each tank. After it's drilled, anodized, almost finished, it goes over here to uh, get a machined sidewall. So these rims here are all set aside to be machined. When they're machined, they kind of look like this. Uh, it's got a silver sidewall. This is all just the uh, aluminum, and you can kind of see how fine uh Maybe that can. is finer than Larry Varney's beard right there, I would have to say. <laughs> so there's not much material being removed there. There's a very, very fine amount. And um, this here is our flat table. Uh, this is just to check the rims, uh, make sure they're nice and flat. They lay flat because the, the flatter the rim, the nicer the wheel's going to build. You can have a not-so-flat rim. You can wrestle with it in your stand for an hour or two hours and uh, you start losing uh, productivity that way so we want to make sure that the rims lay nice and flat before we go through all the building process of them this is our decal department um, this is where each each rim gets a decal put on it and uh, kind of the final check he the guy that does our decal and he's great at what he does um, takes a special person to do something like that and he just makes sure he gives them a once over, make sure they're they're looking good. There's no flaws in the anodizing, um, making sure there's no imperfections. And if there is, he stops and pulls it aside. Here we have uh, all the different hubs that we offer. Um, each one of these hubs, uh, depending on the model, are offered in different spoke counts. So we have, you know. 32, 36, 40 hole spoke counts. The rims and hubs get pulled and placed in a bin, like I showed you earlier on that video, um, set up for a wheel build. So here I have a, a hub and some spokes. Sometimes the spokes need to be cut and uh, to a specific length based on the flange diameter of the hub. Sometimes it's based on the the dish of the rim and so each spoke needs to get cut before it can get built into a wheel these are some of our wheels going out these are uh, going out to I believe Rivendell um, these here are wheels that are built for a cruise bike so those will be going out here probably in the next week or so after that uh, this is our lacing table um, you got a number of different spoke nipple colors there. We do an anodized uh, purple, gold, green, blue, you name it. This is like an antifreeze green, kind of hot. Um, so people can kind of customize their wheels to order, um, and that kind of that makes it personalized to what the, the customer is looking for. This is a wheel that's in the stand here. It's all finished. And this is just to kind of give you an idea of the, how precise some of these wheels are built to. Um, it's kind of hard to tell from my camera. but yeah, just uh, hold it very, very steady, Dave, and we'll see it. 
We can see that beautifully. Yeah. So nice. the guys here shoot for shoot shoot for perfection. There's only a handful of uh, wheel builders, um, and it takes a very special person to do that as well. There's it's a lot of patience. Um, every wheel or rim builds a little differently. The spoke uh, crossing patterns are make things build a little different. Um, I've built wheels for about six months, and I said I've had it. <laughs> There's got to be something better that I'm, that I'm better at here. So from building wheels, I started in the shipping uh, shipping department, and then from the shipping, I worked my way into a sales sales role. But Yeah, it's, it's a very hands-on analog uh, type of process as opposed to a digital process from the the machine builds that you, we talked about earlier. It's uh, that's pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. So this is all our stock of inventory for rims. And there's just a number of different options. The Aero Heat is uh, probably one of our better selling recumbent rims just because it's available in a number of different sizes from like a 700C down to a 26 inch, a 27 and a half inch, uh, 24 inch, 20 inch, 16 inch. So, I mean, it covers a, the whole gamut of, uh, of bikes, bicycle wheel sizes. A cliffhanger is also another pop popular model. The cliffhanger is a nice wide uh, rim. It's available in a 26 inch, 700C, and a 406 size. And that's uh, more of a heavy duty, loaded touring, somebody that really wants to um, run a little wider tire and put as much stuff on their bike and do a 15-month a tour or something. A23, another popular recumbent size. And that's, again, that's because we've rolled it in a number of different options, 20-inch, 16-inch, 24-inch. Um, and that's for somebody that's looking for a lighter, faster uh, rim or wheel build. Dave, if I could just ask you quickly, I've got a question that I think you're kind of answering right now uh, from uh, George Mills uh, on uh, Google Plus, asking about uh, are there inherently uh, whether the inherent differences between the rims for a uh, recumbent and a, a diamond frame. And you kind of talked about that earlier, and just now it has to mostly do with the available sizes. Would you say that's basically it? That's that's basically it. Um, and like Data touched on a little bit earlier, there's. There's not a whole lot of um, matching wheels um, for customers out there. I mean, it, like if we do an Aero Heat, for instance, in a 16 inch and a 559, 26 inch, um, gives you an idea of you know somebody can match that wheel set up for for their matching specific two bike. different size wheels on the same bike, which doesn't yep. happen on an upright. So okay, and it gives it gives people the opportunity to kind of play around too. I've noticed there's people that I've talked to that say, oh yeah, I've, you know, I just wanted to to see what the benefits are of running one size over another, um, and maybe they can get a little more performance out of their their bike and a little more comfort out of their ride. Okay, Patrick Mc. McKellips uh, on live chat. Are most of your rims tubeless compatible? Uh, I would say probably about half now. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I would say probably about half of our rims are tubeless compatible. There's not a whole lot of hub, or not hubs, but there's not a whole lot of tire options out there in some of these sizes. So okay. that's where it doesn't make a big difference to roll it a tubeless compatible versus uh, non-tubeless compatible. Very good. All right, you're getting back to your desk. Uh, Dave, if you'll flip back to your uh, computer screen, we'll wind this up um, and ask you just a couple of final questions and uh, go from there. Yeah, there we go. That was great, uh, first of all. What a, what a nice tour. It really That really wrapped it and tied it all together for us. So thank you for, uh, for doing that. Um, Okay, just kind of winding it up. So tell me what it is that you'd like our audience to know maybe that uh, we haven't talked about here today. Um, I would just say, you know, if you're out on the market for a, for a wheel set, um, please give us a call. Um, email us. Uh, we are your wheel destination. Um, we, Like I said, we do a little bit of everything. We have the ability to um, to 
get different spoke counts. So if there's something out there that you're, you're looking for specifically for a specific bike, um, we have the ability to do that. We customize all our wheels to what your needs are. Um, and the, that's very important. Um, the, they say that the wheel is probably one of the best upgrades you can make on your bicycle or your recumbent or your trike. Um, and it, it is, uh, I know it for myself and, you know, personal experience, you know, you can upgrade your wheel set and you, you'll be amazed at the difference and performance that you can get from it. Okay. that's great. Any final thoughts then Dave? No, um, I just, again, I wanted to thank all our, our customers out there and um, for your loyalty and your brand support. Um, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you guys. And um, that goes for you at the laid back bike report, Gary, that goes for um, Charles at the cycle con and uh, cruise bike, Rands, Volet, Terra trike, cat trike, all these guys that are, are building up uh, their, their, um, their bents with uh, with velocity. That's terrific. Well, Dave, I want to uh, I want to thank you so much for uh, for spending the time with us today and doing such a great job of letting us see uh, what goes into building a velocity wheel. You're absolutely right. Uh, I think there's a great uh, loyalty uh, to be found between uh, bent riders and velocity wheels. I hope that continues and uh, and and even expands. So. Um, before I close out, I want to let you uh, tell us where the best place, again, to find out more information about Velocity at questions and where to find out more information. Where should our, where should our viewers go? Sure. You go to VelocityUSA.com. Uh, you can go to the wheeldepartment.com. Uh, my email, again, is Dave at VelocityUSA. If you have any uh, questions, um, I'd be happy to help you out. That's, that's great. Dave? Um, Thank you so much again for your time and for showing us around. We look forward to seeing you down the road, hopefully in Philadelphia, and uh, spend a little time with you there. Uh, maybe we'll have you back sometime if there's some news uh, to, to deliver to us. Uh, thanks for cooperating and helping us out on the Layback Bike Report. Have a good one. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Thank you. You too. Dave Young, folks. Uh, really interesting. All right. So now we are going to move along to. Um, to Brian's news report, and I'm going to need to share my screen here. So, Brian, are you ready to go? I am. All right, let me see if I can get this, folks. Bear with me for just a second. I'm going to share my screen. Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Get started, and I'm going to roll this. All right, okay. Uh, first up, we have a cruise bike has announced a new model, the new S40. It's an evolution of uh, what was formerly known as the Silvio, I guess it still kind of is in more colloquial terms, but uh, now it's designated the uh, the S40 upgrade from the S30. Basic differences are uh, they've tried to differentiate it a bit from the Vendetta, so the C angle is a bit more upright, which uh, people, I think some people, including myself, will uh, like a lot. Uh, but primarily, uh, now it runs on disc brakes and has room for wider tires. So there is a wide selection of ways you can set this up. You can set it up with dual 700s, like the S30 was as a, you know, a, a fast bike. You can put cyclocross tires on it. You can put 559 touring tires on it. You can be one of those retro weirdos and put 650Bs on it. You can do whatever you want. And uh, it's set up for full touring. You can put racks and panniers on it. It can carry up to four panniers. So they've made it a much more wide, versatile bike, which is uh, pretty exciting. Um, and I, I should be having one soon into review. Very excited to get my hands on it. Uh, it kind of addresses uh, a lot of the things that I've problems I've had with the, the previous S30, and uh, I think it's going to be a great bike, so I'm very excited to get my hands on that. Also, uh, to move on, we have the uh, F-Neo Drive, which is a uh, front gearbox uh, to mount on your bike. Uh, I'm bringing this up because it came out, it was announced actually a while ago, but a lot of these kind of things, it was an Indiegogo thing, and a lot of people are skeptical, and they thought it was going to be vaporware. A lot of these wind up not actually happening. But this actually is, I can attest, because I have one. They sent me one, and I put it on my uh, Aza uh, Tie Fly, and it's a pretty cool setup, uh, much like a schlump drive in the front. But this has three speeds instead of two, and it does not require you to modify the frame at all. It installs with, you know, uh, basic, you just need one of the old school uh, taper bottom bracket tools. And it goes right on. Super easy to set up. Uh, when you order it, they set up the cable length for you and everything. So I had to do nothing other than screw in the bottom bracket and mount the shifter. 
There are two different shifter options. You can get either a trigger or a twist grip style shifter. It's a three speed, pretty good gear ratio, about the same as you get with like a mountain bike triple is pretty much uh, what it comes out to be. Advantages are um, you can shift it while sitting still, like you could a schlum for a roll off or something like that. And again, uh, you don't need to do any modifications to the frame. When you install a schlump, you have to chamfer the bottom bracket, which isn't a big deal, but it's something that most people don't have the ability to do themselves. You need a special tool for it. So that's a very uh, cool, exciting product coming out. We'll also have a re review of that soon. And um, I can tell you next month we're going to have a lot on the news too. There's a lot of stuff that's in the pipeline that uh, is not officially released yet. So uh, next month we'll have even more new product. It's new product season, so look forward to that. Okay, great, Brian. I got you back on here. I'm going to take over the directing. Denny, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, Brian, I think if you can at this point go ahead to Denny's slides and let me get this off my screen and I will be with you guys in a second. Uh, let's see, Denny. There we go. There you are, Denny. You are ready to roll. Yeah, thank you very much yeah. here. I guess I'm alive right now, right? Yep, and then I'll switch over to your pictures as we go here. Go ahead. Okay, I'll start off today with a report from Dave Towns about the Maryland Endurance Challenge. <clears throat> the first Maryland Endurance Challenge race was held on May 20th at Mount St. Mary's College in Emmitsburg, Maryland. The event featured three races, a 12-hour, a 6-hour, and a 3-hour race. Both the 12-hour and 6-hour races used a 34.2-mile main loop with three loops being done by the 12-hour contestants and two laps by the six-hour racers. After completing the required large loop course, the racers were channeled into a six-mile loop. The last loop could be prorated based on the average speed if it was started without enough time to complete a full lap. 55 racers signed up for the 12-hour race. Only two recumbent riders entered in the 12-hour race. Terry Duffy of Greensburg, Indiana, and myself, this is uh, Dave speaking here, uh, Terry was riding a new Schlitter Encore, and I was on a CA2. Day the course left the college and headed north into a 15-mile-an-hour headwind. The course was a hilly by Florida standards with a little over 1,200 feet of gain per lap. Now, a few of the hills were very steep with one of a maximum pitch of 7.1%. The road surfaces were quite good and were marked with arrows. The highlight of the course were the three covered bridges along the course. The race was chip time, but there was a checkpoint about halfway where the racers and number times were noted. Uh, the system seemed to work well, although the final results for the actual mileage were posted several days later. Uh, as this was the first running of the endurance challenge, however, there were some things on the course that, uh, which will need to be improved. The route marking needs to be improved. Additionally, the halfway checkpoint was located on a relatively poor sight line and at the base of a steep hill. The road surfaces were good, but the roads were a bit narrow in places. As a recumbent rider, splitting my time from Illinois and Florida, I found the course to be absolutely beautiful. Even though I started cramping through the first lap, I had an enjoyable day and did 135 miles, and Terry did about 208. The overall winner went just over a bit over 259 miles, and given the hills and headwinds, it was quite impressive. Uh, this was a fairly well-run race on a very pretty course. I have no doubt it will improve as they continue. Uh, Dave also says, I, I always approach these things, these types of events as a personal challenge. I've never been particularly fast, yet I enjoy the challenge of pushing myself. Furthermore, attending these events has enabled me to meet some of the, some very interesting characters. And Dave, I can, I can commiserate with you on that. We've met before, and you are an interesting character. There was a number of Ram Riders and Ultra Marathon uh, record holders at this race. I generally found that are extremely friendly and supportive of other racers. If you're open to a challenge, uh, challenging yourself, I would suggest you look at the UMCA calendar and to participate. Good advice, Dave. Thanks a lot for the great report. Uh, next up, uh, a reminder that Alan Doom is currently riding the Trans Am bike race from Astoria, Oregon to Yorktown, Virginia. This is day two as he started the race yesterday at 5 a.m. 
Uh, there is a bit of an update here. Uh, about uh, it was been about 12 hours into the race, he crashed uh, and uh, banged up, uh, got some road rash and banged up some ribs and in, in an elbow. So, but I uh, checked just before the show this morning or this afternoon about 1 p.m. And it shows him as 172.5 miles. Uh, he's the only recumbent in the event and hopes for a 30-day finish. Uh, Alan and all the racers can be followed on trackleaders.com. Uh, we will have a link in the description section on the YouTube video. video. I wish him luck. Uh, I know he's trained for this thing for a year and been looking forward to it. And I really hope he can continue. It's uh, uh, if you guys get a chance to uh, drop on track leaders and, and give him some words of encouragement. There's a, a bar there where you can uh, post some comments and he does check. Uh, matter of fact, he was checking today at around uh, one o'clock or about, you know, we're on one o'clock today. Um, finally, well, this is not really finally, but it was finally race across America starts in a little over a week. So racers leave Oceanside, California on June 13th and teams will be leaving the 17th, both solos and teams start at 12 p.m. Pacific time on their respective dates. This year, uh, one solo recumbent uh, again is uh, the venerable 72-year-old Sergey Zimin. He will be uh, launching his sixth attempt at crossing the United States in less than 12 days and 20 hours. Last year, he made it to Kim, Colorado. If he should make it this year, he would be the oldest person to solo finish Ram. Uh, there will be one hand cycle solo this year. Uh, it's Andre Kalich, yeah, Kalich of Edmonds, Washington, a double amputee and an accomplished triathlete. He will be the first hand cyclist to attempt Ram. He comes with a solid endurance competition background and has a seasoned and dedicated crew. Uh, on the team side, cruise bikes 300 miles for cure is a four-person RAN team consisting of Maria and Jim Parker, who we've seen here a bunch of times. And um, they're one of the sponsors on occasion and just really great people. Uh, with them is Kevin Gamble and Larry Osland. No strange to this race, they'll be shooting for the four-person recumbent mixed record. They always raise money uh, to for the brain cancer research. So uh, check their site out and... Uh, and it's three three thousand miles for a cure, Denny. Just because uh, they're probably going, hopefully, all the way. I think you said three hundred. So, Denny, <laughs> and it looks like we have lost Denny on the traditional middle of the sports report. So I'll take it over here. Yeah, it's three thousand miles for a cure and uh, raising money for brain cancer research. Cruise bike, as always. And finally, Red Pearl Racing. Uh, we've had uh, these two, Sandy Earl and Bill Spath, on the show. Two-person recumbent mixed team from Arcadia, California, consisting uh, of those two. Between them, they have a slew of endurance race credentials in the West. Uh, we're very pleased and excited to be, oh, oh, I should say Denny is pleased and excited to be one of the awesome crew that they have assembled. Uh, the raising funds for Backpacks for Kids program, information on how you can help will be uh, found at redpearlracing.com uh, on the website. We'll have that in the description as well. And uh, all the Ram racers and teams will be visible on trackleaders.com, as, uh, as Denny said. Um, and then here's a last minute update. Um, you might remember uh, last year talking about Kurt Servogel and his hammer record at the time. Um, we also, his, his wife, Alicia Servogel, uh, completed her one year highest annual record attempt with 32,415 miles. That should give her an age group record. The mileage needed to be certified by the Ultra Marathon Cycling Association is, is yet to be done, but we expect that will happen. Alicia did some of her early riding uh, attempt on a Schlitter Encore. So we do wish congratulations to Alicia. Uh, nice going and a lot of hard work involved with that. Um, so, um, Denny, are you still there? Are you back? Yeah, yeah, I'm back here. Okay. I'm back. You, well, go ahead and finish it up. You know how you like to say, stay on the oh, bike. Oh, great. Yeah, I'll put myself on. and I, So that's it from here, Gary. Uh, stay on the bike and keep moving forward until right. next time. If only you could stay on the bike for the whole sports report. That yeah, is if only I could. Yeah. 
All right, that's All right. fine. We're going to move along anyways. That's a, a great report. Thank you very, very much. Um, Thanks for oh, picking and, it up for me, Gary. Yeah, no problem. Um, uh, just uh, as an addendum here, Scott Radliff, we've talked about him before on the show, another fine ultra racer, uh, is on live chat and said, uh, Alan Doom checked back in and he has over 50 miles on the day and still rolling on. So we're hoping for the best for Alan that, he, uh, that he's able to recover and continue his, uh, his race. All right, I think at this point we're going to move along to Dana, head out to uh, North Hollywood, California. Dana, Hi there. Uh, I'm here. Let, <laughs> let's see. What, Dana, can you, is that your cell phone? What do you got going there today? It's my cell phone. I'm going to try you this. flip it sideways for us? Okay. Let's see if that's much better. Okay. Does that work better? Yeah, okay. we can the picture that way. Wh and, whichever uh, way doesn't show my double chin. Yeah, I think both, actually. But you okay. go ahead and, uh, and, and tell us what, what's going on today. So um, I was going to talk uh, briefly about front derailers, and I will, but I wanted to, you guys touched on dish, and I, I wanted to, on wheels earlier. Hey, that's not me. Get that picture off of there. <laughs> I don't know if that's the picture that everybody's seeing, if they're actually seeing me. Um, but I want to show dishing. Uh, just really quickly to kind of touch back on what uh, David Velocity saying. That would be saying. great. That would be great. So if, if you look here, at this wheel, you can see that the spokes on this side, the left side of the wheel, are longer than the spokes on the right side of the wheel. Dishing is really the process of moving the rim one way or the other as it's relative to the, the drops, uh, the dropouts on the frame. So one of the neat things that Velocity does is they actually make a rim that's off center. Uh, the, the challenge with dishing in general is that the spokes on the right side end up being shorter these are the spokes that are brought into tension, while the spokes on the left side of the wheel are longer and they, by default have to be looser. They can't be as tight. So David really briefly mentioned the OC rim that Velocity does. What they're doing with that is rather than placing the uh, spokes right in the center of the rim, they're actually moving it over to the left a little bit on the rear wheel so that the spokes on the left side and the right side are much closer to the same length. What that allows you to do is get much closer to even spoke tension. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to touch on that really quickly, try and give a, people a visual demonstration as well as explaining that a little bit more. Any questions? Gary, you look, you look, you look like confounded. I look like I always do. No, that was a oh, wonderful okay. explanation. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's much better to be able to visually take a look yeah. at that. It's, I, yeah. I kind of put Dave in a bad spot to asking him to describe dishing, which yeah, clearly needs a, needs a picture. So it needs a visual. Thanks, yeah, thanks for helping us out, Dana. Go ahead. Okay. So now I just want to take a look at one of the more exciting features on bikes. Uh, front derailleur. There's one there. Uh, what I want, this is on my, my Bichetta Corsa. Hopefully nothing is going to fall apart this week. Uh, first, I want to start by showing you two different front derailers. Uh, you can see the one on the right is the microshift derailleur that is on the Bichetta. I don't know if you can see it, but the arm is much longer than the derailleur, the Shimano 105 derailleur that's on the left. Uh, these are two very different kinds of derailleurs, and they have different uses. This Shimano 105 is your standard road derailleur, even though it's a triple. Um, this is a flat bar derailleur, and that's going to become meaningful in a moment. Because when we're setting up front derailleurs, we want to make sure that we're getting a derailleur that is compatible with the shifter. Um, if your shifters are friction, this is irrelevant. You can use whichever one of these derailleurs you want. But if you happen to be setting up one of the 10-speed the XO uh, grip shifters, that is, uh, it's, not, it's not a friction shifter, it's very three discrete settings, you need to have the right front derailleur with it. If you try putting this Shimano derailleur on there, whether it be an Altegra, a 105, you'll quickly discover it doesn't work because it's a flat bar shifter, so you need to have the flat bar derailleur. So just a little bit of something, we, we see that a lot coming in, people coming in where they've purchased shifters and they've purchased a front derailleur that don't work together and they can't figure out why it doesn't work together. So in terms of setting up the derailleur, uh, you know, they all come with instructions. The instructions are, are actually pretty good. You'll see here, I've got just a couple millimeters between the, the uh, large chainring and the bottom edge of the cage on the derailleur. 
that's how you want to set it up. Uh, from the top, if you look down, you can see that the cage of the derailleur is with the chain rings. I will tell you on the microshift derailleurs, it ac actually wants to kick out uh, just a slight, I'm sorry, kick in just a slight bit, because as you shift it, it will also pull out from the back of the derailleur. Um, and then it's uh, the, the big adjustment on the front derailleur are the set screws, right? Now, I have actually screwed this derailleur up just to kind of show you how these work. If I pedal here, you can hear that thing's really noisy. I don't know if you can see it, but that chain is rubbing against the derailleur. So what I want to do, I'm going to back out a little bit here. I'm going to adjust the uh, inner derailleur screw. You can see I can just, by tightening that up, I can move that derailleur, derailleur over until it's not rubbing anymore. Now, I pedal, it's absolutely silent. So that's setting up the first stop, the inner stop. Um, then what you want to do is attach the cable to the derailleur. You can see I've unattached this. You also Dana, want to Dana make, don't forget yes. to flip your phone back, bud. Oh, uh, I am flipped, aren't I? No. Did it, it, it went vertical. Uh, Did, darn phone. Okay, don't worry about okay. it. Go, you're fine. I can see fine. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, first thing you want to make sure is that your shifter is in the lowest gear possible. You can see here, this shifter is not. So we want to go ahead and turn that all the way down to the lowest setting so that you get as much of the cable coming out as possible. Here's another common mistake that we see. This is going to be complicated because I really need three hands for this. But you will see there is a tab right there. The cable needs to go over that tab. If you run it underneath, which actually seems the obvious way to do it, the derailleur will not shift well. It has to be over that front, that tab. And I'm going to have to pull away a second while I uh, actually tighten that cable. Excuse me. Uh, excuse me. You don't need to over tighten these cables. Uh, they will fray if you over tighten it. You can see now that cable's attached. As I turn the ca as I turn the pedals, everything's working beautifully in that small chain ring. Now I'm going to start shifting that up, and you can actually see the derailleur moving. There we go. That pulls it up into the middle ring. Now you'll see when I try and pull it up into the top. I hope it actually won't go. Ah, oh, it went. It wasn't supposed to. Let me um, let me mess this up more. The idea was for it to be set incorrectly so I could show you how to set it. Let's see, we'll tighten that bolt up. So now, when I go to bring that up, you can see that chain isn't moving. I need to loosen that that outer set screw just a little bit and you'll start seeing that derailleur coming out because there's tension on that cable. Can you see that? Yeah, there we go. And then I'll pedal it. And see, now it pops right up. I actually want to bring it out a little bit further. As you can see, right in there, that chain is still rubbing against the derailleur. So I'm going to loosen up that bolt a little bit more. I told you this was like the most fascinating piece of the, the bike, right? Cool. I'm fascinated, but, you know, I'm yeah. easily amused, so that's fine. You're doing good. Okay. We're going to uh, pull the shifter a little bit more. Come on, get me back to my screen. My phone is, is – uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, it kind of froze up there. There we go. Now you're back. Now this is properly adjusted. You want to make sure that there is not a large enough gap here for the chain to come off. Uh, of the uh, chain ring to the outside uh, when, when you're shifting. And I would actually say this is a touch too wide, or a little, I'm sorry, too far out. I'm actually going to bring that derailleur in just a touch because I don't want this thing derailing when I'm riding. All right? That was me just shifting it. There we go. That's beautiful. And that is setting up your front derailleur. All right, Dana. Nice, now, let nice me get job. A, a couple tips. Just a yep. couple really quick tips. Sure. Uh, everybody's had this happen when you derail your chain off the outside when you're riding. Don't come to a stop. 
you can actually get that chain back onto the chain ring while you're riding as long as you have enough momentum. All you have to do is pedal and shift to either your middle or your small ring. The derailleur is going to catch that chain and just pop it right back over. Okay? Very easy to do. There's no reason to stop if you derail your chain on the outside. You can do the same thing if you derail your chain on the inside. Uh, if I get back down there. Right, if it goes off, this one's a little harder, but if you catch it in time before you lose much momentum, you just shift to your large chain ring, and it will just pull that chain right back up onto the chain rings. So don't think that you've, because you've derailed, derailed your chain that you have to come to a complete stop to fix it and get your hands all dirty. Oh, that's good to know. So keep yeah. you going. So that's about it. Dana, how uh, soon uh, How soon are those uh, three those uh, three gear boxes, uh, th the, the, uh, the front chain uh, three gear box going to replace the front chain ring that, uh, that uh, Brian was talking about? Um, not very soon. Never. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, the fact is uh, a, a derailleur is such a simple piece of equipment. They're incredibly easy to adjust on the fly. If you have, if you've been watching my, uh, my posts, they're, they're very easy to adjust. And you just can't beat them for simplicity and and less expensive, gonna... certainly, right? A oh, fraction. a whole lot less expensive. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you, it's been frustrating finding the right front derailers for triples because a lot of manufacturers aren't doing triples anymore. We're really left with just the low to middle end uh, Shimano derailers and micro shifts. So, uh, no, no Dura Ace triples anymore. No, okay. I, I hope they don't fade out the Ultegras. Sounds good. Yeah, Joseph Hardy front, says, the, good tip, they, by the way, Dana. Good tip, Joseph Hardy says on live chat. Oh, yeah. Um, on your tips there at the end, I think. Uh, sure. Go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. The, gear, the front gear boxes have their place. There's uh, for really heavy duty touring stuff. They're fun. They're maintenance free. But yeah, the, for 90% of people, front derailleur is completely fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Dana, thanks, bud. My pleasure. Have a we'll wonderful see you week. next time around. And yeah. I'm looking forward to July. We're going to yep. argue a little bit. Okay. Oh, that's that's what we're looking for. <laughs> controversy. It's what keeps us controversy, going Controversy. Absolutely. All absolutely. right. Well, no controversy. Let me just catch up real quick. I see Dave uh, Dave DeYoung is still with us. So, Dave, if you're listening, I want a, a couple of live chat uh, uh, comments, not really questions. Uh, Ed Bowen, our good friend from uh, Germany. I love my new rear wheel uh, that they made for me with a Chris King hub, and I'm, I'm sure the they is velocity on that one, Dave. And uh, let's see, I think um, I, uh, SBC Clydesdale, I am so impressed with Velocity. So just some, uh, just some nice uh, little uh, comments there, Dave. So awesome. thanks for sticking Appreciate with it. it. All right, uh, Brian, if you're ready to go, uh, yeah, I think you are there. Um, let's go on to the uh, Google Plus community business. Uh, Danny, if you want to switch over to the slide. There we go. Okay, uh, next one then, Brian. We're going to... Uh, uh, talk a little bit of the community business. Uh, we've got uh, 1,155 members at this point, so it continues to grow. Thank you all very much. Put your pins on the map there so we know where you are at the at the site. Uh, here are the uh, contest winners this month. First of all, picture of the month. This is Peter Panconin, my fat cat early in the morning. Wow, you know, I just uh, that just caught my eye as a, a beautiful shot. So uh, thank you, Peter. Congratulations on that one. Uh, okay, the video of the month. Uh, uh, Julie Lovegrove, perhaps you remember the name. Yes, they were er with us a little earlier. And uh, they shot a little video. I mentioned it while I was talking. Oh, I was talking to her earlier. But uh, that's Mark out front, and he neglected to make a left turn. And uh, Julie made sure that uh, he knew about it from behind there on that video. It's kind of cute, and it gives you a little idea of the scenery there uh, in uh, – Cycling in Japan on the Shamanami Kaido cycling route. So that's, I guess, where that was. Uh, moving on to the winner of the discussion of the month, it's Mark Roby. And uh, he was asking about options for mounts on his Terratrike Sportster uh, and got into a pretty good discussion on the various ways that he could mount things on it. So um, that was an interesting discussion. And thank you for that, uh, Mark. Congratulations. And our Pilius Poulter post of the month. There it is. Uh, he took this one on a bridge over the Danube. Just another gorgeous shot, as always, for, from Pilius. So 
Uh, thanks a lot uh, for that one, Pileus. Okay, and now we're going to go right on back, if we can, into a little final message from our sponsor. So folks, before we wind it up today, I wanted to thank our sponsor, Recumbent and Tandem Rider Magazine. They would like me to remind you not to miss the 2017 Recumbent CycleCon, happening October 6th through 8th at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center. Get more information in the newest issue of Recumbent and T Tandem Rider Magazine. Again, it's online and it's free at www.rtrmag.com. All that again in the description of the YouTube video. You'll see it there. So we're going to start the closing portion of our show and the next laid back bike report. Very, very excited to have an interview and a presentation by this gentleman right here. So if uh, if any of you have seen our um, our special from Spetsy laid back bike report that we did uh, from Germany, you're going to see my short interview with Carl Georg Rasmussen. Uh, Carl Georg is uh, is a Dane. He, uh, he invented the Lytra Velomobile and pretty much brought uh, the modern Velomobile into being. He is also a historian of the Velomobile. We'll go back much further than what he did and bring us up to date. He has a really interesting uh, presentation. I hope you'll join us for that. If you're at all curious about Velomobiles or you have one, you will not want to miss his history of the Velomobile on the next laid back bike report. And I guess I could probably give you a date, but which I forgot to look up. Wait, I'm sorry, folks. I'm going to do it this second. It's going to be uh, July 9th. July 9th. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, also, um, all the as we've mentioned a bunch of times on this show, all of the uh, links mentioned uh, in the show will be in the description of the video below, uh, and also a clickable table of contents. You know, and I know this show goes long, and I wanted this month to kind of show you, in case you don't know, you can watch the show in little segments. We have every segment uh, with a clickable, if you're online, uh, on web, you can click uh, the various times and go to that particular section. Uh, and even if you're on mobile, it'll show you the time so you can quickly uh, slide over to it. So. Uh, watch the show and the parts that you want or if you want to watch it all and watch it in segments. It's easy to do. Clickable table of contents. That's why I do it. Okay, and I want to uh, get to the point where we can thank all of the uh, folks. So, um, <laughs> Brian, you, you want to get yourself on or are you going to just say goodbye uh, uh, incognito today? Brian is muted too, so okay. I'll, I'll just do I'll just do it by voice. I don't want to. Okay, I don't Brian. want to risk. I don't want to tempt fate. Okay, yeah, we, it's worked out really well, I think, today with the slideshow. Brian, uh, for the sports report, for being there, supporting us, uh, and for doing the slideshow, a great job again today. Brian, thanks so much. You're very well. All right. Uh, and uh, let's see, we've got uh, Dana, who's got his icon on. He may be taking a snooze right now, so thank you, uh, Dana for the, the great report. Uh, we still got uh, Dave with us uh, uh, from, uh, from Velocity. So Dave, what a great job. Thanks again, not only for your uh, wonderful uh, interview, but for sticking with us and watching the show. We appreciate that. Great, thanks for having me. All right, Denny, can you switch yourself on there? I hope so. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Ben, thanks. You came, yeah, well, you went, you came back, whatever. I You're did. back yeah. now. Yeah. You did a great job on the directing. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks, Gary. Great to be oh, here. Great. All right, let's flip it over to Larry. All right. And Larry, you did uh, a great job on right. the live chat as usual. Uh, thanks uh, to you for, for doing that and for being with us. We sure appreciate it. Okay, I had an enjoyable time and learned a lot. So it was okay. It was good. That's good. that's what we're after, I think. So okay, thanks to all of you. Thanks to the folks. Uh, Denny, if you come on back to me. Thanks to the folks on the live chat. Uh, we've got Volonic on there and Matt and Marco Ropers and Jim Pratt, Joseph Hardy. Uh, uh, so many, uh, my first trike. Oh, great. We see, uh, uh, we see him on there too. So, uh, he's hoping to get to uh, cycle con so many people on the live chat. Thank you for your comments and questions. Uh, those of you that came in late, uh, we hope you watch the earlier part of the show. Uh, and, and I want to thank, of course, all of you 
Even if uh, you couldn't make the live chat and watch it uh, live, we, we, we really appreciate you watching later on on YouTube. All right, so uh, announcements. Here's, here's something interesting that I hope to be able to pull off. Uh, as we've mentioned on the show in a couple of weeks, uh, Ram, Race Across America, is going to be starting. And part of where they go on the route is right through uh, the southern part of Ohio. I'm not too far away from there. Uh, I hope to take uh, a, a crew uh, of people I can wake up, hopefully not in the middle of the night. Uh, or we don't know when they're going to come through here, of course. But we've got recumbent folks coming through. Uh, we've got 3,000 miles to the cure. We've got Red Pearl. Uh, I, I don't know if the uh, older gentleman that uh, Denny talked about is going to make it this far. But uh, we definitely want to We want to see if we can meet up with them. And if we can, I might go live on, uh, on YouTube and do a, a, just a kind of a short uh, show of what's going on at the time. We'll... Uh, get, you guys will get a notification of that if you are subscribed on our YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, if not, we're also uh, planning to bring our video equipment down and, and maybe getting a, a few short interviews as they come through and maybe stop and say hi to us. So we'll see what we can do. It's, uh, that's, that's very much up in the air, but uh, if we can capture them coming through, we will do it. So, uh, yeah, how can you support us as we wrap everything up? Of course subscribe we've talked about that before the little red subscribe button uh check out our website uh if you take a look at our website uh, denny can you go to the graphic yep. on that i'll talk about that for a minute as usual uh laidbackbikereport.com uh, uh, you'll find it if you click that little uh white eye in the upper right hand corner and you and when you do you will see this home page uh, on that, you will find on the front page all our sponsors at the top. Please, please support them. They make this show possible. Uh, you're going to find, uh, uh, click on a, um, uh, a link and go to the upcoming, or I'm sorry, our past shows. You're going on the front page. You're going to see our most uh, recent show. You'll see our upcoming shows and the calendar of events. Um, and you can sign up for our mailing list, and I'll shoot you an email out uh, the day of the show so that you have an idea what is coming up there and yeah that uh, past show uh, link will get you to our uh, past shows and the live uh, chat archive uh, you'll find some bonus material always stick on all the pictures that we use and that sort of thing and some of the video maybe that we have that we can't uh, fit on the show so yep and then of course you can also buy a ball cap there you go Larry always models it so beautifully uh, buy a hat, $20, uh, $5 shipping and handling. Uh, that will help us out if you do that. So you can find all of that uh, at our website, laidbackbikereport.com. Back to me, Danny, if you would. Yeah. So I want to, uh, at this point, there we go. Folks, we're going to end it up. So until our next webcast from all of us here on the Laid Back Bike Report, so long, Bent Riders.